Welcome to our online message for this week. It remains a privilege and a pleasure to share the word of God with you. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Pastor Nee. I am one of the ministering pastors of the WFC or Word of Faith Centre, Luton and Bedford. To find out more about us, you can go to our website www.wfc.org.uk. You also have the opportunity to go back and look at our messages on our YouTube channel. God bless you. And for the members of the family, it remains a pleasure to be with you, to share the word of God with you. I hope you're having a good week and I pray that as you go into your new week, that the Lord will lead and guide you in everything that you do. So without further ado, let's go into the word of God and see what God is sharing with us today. The title for my message is Knowing and Understanding and Defeating the Enemy's Playbook. It sounds very, very mouthful. Knowing, understanding and defeating the enemy's playbook. Now, you might wonder how this came to be. And I'm just going to share something with you. I, I like sports. I enjoy watching sports. And one of the things I've noticed in sports is that many sport coaches have what they call their playbook or rule book or book of strategies that they follow through. If you're in American and if you're in America and you are playing for one of the American football teams, I don't mean soccer, I mean NFL, you will find that a lot of the coaches they have what is called playbooks. And in those playbooks are strategies that they will be given to each player, each game, as it's been called. If you ever watch NFL on TV, you will notice that they use a lot of terminologies, a lot of names, and each one of those names and terminologies, they refer to a specific part of the game. So it requires for every player to know the strategies, to know their role in those strategies, to know what to do. Similarly, in basketball and even in soccer, or football as we call it here. So every one of them have their own strategies. So the defenders, they, they work on their pieces, they know where to stand, where to be at any specific time. And same with the strikers, they work with their partners to know where to be. If you're a linebacker, you know how to run. If you're, def if you're a defensive player, you know where to be. If you're a quarterback, you know the games you're gonna call. And that is very, very important. But the question is this, how does that relate to us as a believer? Now, I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you to start off. And I want us to go quickly into the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says this. And I'm going to be reading from verses 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So for the weapon of our warfare and not cannot. We're in a war. Saints, that's one thing that you and I have to understand, right? We are in a battle. The, the, the Bible told us in many verses, especially if you go and look in the book of Romans, especially Romans 8, you talk about the flesh warring against the spirit. In the book of Timothy, it says similar thing that we're soldiers and we need to be ready to fight the battle that we've been calling to. So it's very, very important for us to grab that first and foremost that we are in a war and we have weapons to fight that war. And the good thing that we can talk about when we're talking about this warfare is that we're not fighting a war to lose. Yeah, because the Bible has already told us in 2 Corinthians 2.14 that Christ is leading us in triumph. Yeah, in 2 Corinthians 2 14, let me have a look at, let me turn to you very, very quickly and read it to you so that you know that the warfare that you're already fighting, you are already emerging as a winner. They say now, say now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. So you are not fighting this battle to lose. But I want to, I'm going to stop there for just for a second while I introduce you to the second scripture. And in the second scripture, it talks to us, it says in Ephesians 6, yeah, let's go quickly to Ephesians chapter 6. And I love it in Ephesians chapter 6 because it talked about the same thing but in a different way and also on how to fight that war. And if you look at it from here, 
in verse 12. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers and rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So you and I, we are wrestling, not against flesh and blood. But the key thing for you and I is this, in spite of the fact that we know that Christ is leading us in triumph, and as he, as he says it to us in 1 Corinthians 15 as well, he talks about the fact that we're immovable, unshakable because we've been led in triumph. It's important that we know the enemy strategy, that we know how the enemy works. And I'm going to share an history lesson with you. I, I like history. And one of the things I'm going to share with you, I'm going to take you back to around the 70s, the Vietnam War. Yeah. In the Vietnam War, the Americans had the best equipment. For those of you who know about the war, you knew that the Vietnamese army won the war in the end. And that was probably the first time the Americans really suffered a loss in any war over a lengthy period of time. But why did the enemy, why did the Americans lose or why did the enemy win? The enemy won because they were not fighting the war. The Americans wanted them to fight the war. The Americans had all the armaments. They had all the guns, the helicopters, the tanks, everything that they've been so much used to in finding a war. But their enemy, the North Vietnamese army, were not actually fighting the war according to the rules that the Americans are used to. They were fighting what we now define as the guerrilla warfare. They come through warrens and caves and holes and come up and attack the American bases and then they disappear again. But we time with a war of attrition. And that is one of the things that we need to understand about, about the enemy's playbook. It's a war of attrition. It carries on and on and on until it breaks you down. And that was what happened to the Americans. We time gradually and gradually the North Vietnamese soldiers. They took ground and ground and ground. And it come to a point where the Americans have to retreat back. So the lesson from that for all of us is in order to face our enemies, we, know to, we need to know what strategies they are fighting with. And it's in the same with us in our life as a believer. Yes, we know that we have victory through Christ Jesus. We know that, yes, we are putting on the whole armor. We know exactly what we're told to do, to pray, to confess, to make the right pronouncement. However, if we do not understand how the enemy wages war against us, we will always end up on the losing side. So I want us to have a quick look at the key scripture that I really want you to hold on to. And that key scripture is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So bear with me and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says this. Look at this one line. It says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Wow. He has his own devices. And as believers, we should know what those devices are. We should not be ignorant of them. So Paul was writing to the church in Corinth and said, we are aware of the devices of the enemy. We're not ignorant of the Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, it says, for my people perish for lack of knowledge. So for us as believers, the enemy will continue to fight against us. It's a war of attrition. Remember what I said? It's a war that he keeps fighting. Even when we think we won, he comes back and tries to fight and over and over again. However, the more we are aware of his strategies, it's easy to win the battle against him. Yeah? This is a battle that the enemy cannot win because we know these strategies. But I want us to take us a little further back. Now, what is the basis of this strategy of the enemy? And I love our Lord Jesus. It's, he explained the modus operandi by which the enemy work. And I want us to turn our Bible quickly to 1 Peter 5 verse 8. I haven't told you the strategy of the enemy, but I want you to look at these scriptures first. In 1 Peter 5, 8, turn to it quickly with me. Praise God. I hope you're catching something from this. 
He says this in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I pray that God will never let you be devoured by the enemy. But he says that he's sprawling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. To devour means to kill, either to kill to eat or to kill for pleasure. If you're in the animal kingdom, <laughs> the, high, the, the lion will kill to devour. Or maybe once, once he's had his fill and it's not that bothered anymore, he will kill just to play around with. And that's not God wants from all of us. That's not what God wants for us. But also, if we go quickly to the book of John, verse 10. It's a popular scripture that we all know. It says this. I'm turning to it quickly. We will be there shortly. In John 10, 10, it says this. It says, the thief does not come except to, except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Did you see the enemy's modus operandi? Modus operandi, the method of his operation, he says he comes to do nothing except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is the enemy's agenda. But he has a way, he has a rule book that he follows. And I want to introduce you to that what rule book is. And the more you and I can understand that rule book, the more we can defeat him, the more we will be victorious in Christ Jesus. The more you'll be able to walk in your victory because Jesus has already shown us that example. And we're going to be touching on that shortly. I want us to go quickly to the book of John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, Christ had a discourse, uh, had a discussion with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sadducees, you know, the ones I'm talking about. Yeah? And they had a discussion. And as part of that discussion, I'm going to read from verse 44. Earlier before that, they were querying their lineage. They were hugging with cry that they are, they come from the lineage of Abraham. And therefore, they are above all rules. They, they were coming up with all kind of agreement with Christ. And Christ turned to them and he says this. He says, you are of your father, the devil. Now listen to this. It says, and the desire of your father you want to do. It was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Did you catch that? Let me, let me point that out for you. He retraced back to John 10.10 10, where he said, Jesus, that the enemy come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He said it was a murderer from the beginning. Yeah? He does not stand in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Wow. So did you see the foundation the rock bed of the enemy strategy is lie. Yeah? yeah, and look at and look at what he said. I'm going to repeat that so that you can get it into you, so that you can understand it a little bit better. The enemy was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth. Anything that does not stand in the truth, anything that does not stand in the truth of the word of God is a lie. Yeah, he says there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. So the main resource that the enemy has to fight against you and I is what? Our lies. So the only way he plays against us is rule book, his playbook is founded on one thing and only one thing, on lies. So he is a liar and is the father of it. Wow. So you want to understand the enemy strategy? The enemy strategy starts from lies. It tells lies. Anything that is opposite of lies, anything that, anything that is opposite of lies is truth. Anything that is opposite of truth is lie. There's no white truth 
or or any colorful truth or half truth there is either lie or truth and the enemy doesn't give you half truth because if he's telling you half truth he's telling you a lie so you need to understand that and the main key strategy that the enemy used against every believer has always been lies yeah so you and i need to understand that that the main tool of oppression of the enemy has always been lies and it will continue to be and from the beginning what did he do if we go quickly to the book of genesis in the book of genesis we learned about how satan tricked adam and eve right in genesis chapter i believe let's turn quickly to it i always like us to look at the word there's no point in us not turning to the bible the bible is the life for every believer and it's always important that we make sure that we quote it rightly from the word and here in genesis chapter 3 it talks about the interaction between adam and eve and the serpent and the bible told us that the devil came and disguised as a serpent and he tricked them into eating the fruit which has been forbidden but what did he do he twisted the truth he twisted what the father has said to them in the beginning look at what he says here he says uh, uh, let me read it from verse one now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the lord god has made and he said to the woman as god indeed said you shall not eat of every fruit of the tree of the garden and the woman said to the serpent we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So you can see straight away, he took what he what told him and turned it around and turned it into a lie. Yeah? He turned it straight into a lie. And that has only been the strategy of the enemy from the beginning to the end. And my victory, your victory, stems from knowing the truth that Christ had come and died for us on the cross. We've been saved by grace through faith that we are no longer subjected to the enemy that we're new creation all things about us have passed away we need to hold on to those fundamental truths that god loves us that he cares about us that he desires the very best for us because what the enemy always wanted to do is to take advantage of any situation that you and i are going through and turn it around turn into half lies or turn it into half truth or make it into full lies so that you would doubt who you are in christ you don't have to doubt who you are in Christ. You don't have to subject yourself to the lies of the enemy. You know that every conversation, listen to this. Yes, you don't want to have a conversation with the enemy. But every time that the enemy comes, it will always be based on lies. You need to understand that. It will never come from the basis of truth to talk to you. It will never do that. And the battleground is in our mind so let's do let's go back to where we were before yeah so quickly let's go back to second corinthians 10 because i'm still going to share some other scriptures with you but i really want us to understand that the only way that the enemy can win over us is if we allow our mind to be the battleground on which he plays with now look at this it says here it says from i'm reading from verse 4 onwards now remember before i only read second corinthians 10 verse 4 now from verse 4 it says for the weapon of our worth are not carnal but mighty in god for pulling down strongholds now it says casting down arguments and every i thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of god bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of christ everything now listen to this now let me explain this to you casting down arguments and i think that exalt itself against the knowledge of it anything that exalts itself anything that thinks it is bigger stronger more able than god is a lie 
So the battlefield starts in our mind. Yeah? He said, we cast down every argument. Every thought, the thoughts is in our mind. And the only way the enemy can do that is by bringing lies in. Because the lie stand against every thought, against every knowledge of God that you have. And I'm going to give you an example. One of the things that the enemy does, or actually his playing ground, is your circumstance. The enemy takes your circumstance and he turns it around. What do I mean by that? Let me give you a little bit of an example. Assuming you are not feeling well, the enemy comes to you and start reminding you that your generation, your father's or your mother's generation has had this sickness and they've died because of it and you're going to die. That there's no recovery for you. Yet the Bible told you and I in the book, it says this to us, it says, by his stripes you are healed. Isn't that what it says? It says, by his stripes, in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says you were healed. It says in Psalm 107, verse 20, it says, he sent his words and healed them. Christ also, when he was talking to the Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7, he says that healing is bread of the children. Yeah? So we can see that how the enemy would twist that. So Henry Henry will look at your circumstance and he will twist it, he will twist, twist it into a line and say, you cannot be healed. Who says you cannot be healed? Yeah? Whose report shall we believe? Isn't that what Isaiah 53 started with? Whose report shall we believe? We believe the report of the Lord. And the report of the Lord says that you are healed. The report of the Lord says you walk in perfect health. The result of the Lord says that by his strife you are healed. But if the enemy can allow you or can make you to believe that you're not going to be healed, you have already fallen. And it's one by employing that simple playbook rule, the lie. Let me give you another example. Eh? You are going through a circumstance and you're very anxious. Very anxious, very worried. And, it's, and the enemy comes and he whispers in your ear, you're going to lose your job. You're not going to be able to feed your family. Everything is not going to be okay. Yet the word of God told us in Psalm 23, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Yeah? He said to us, cast all your cares upon him in First Peter. For he cares for you. He also said this, it says in Philippians 4 verse 6, it said, be anxious for nothing. Isn't it? Isn't that what it said? But if the enemy can make you to believe that God is going to come through, he's not going to come through for you on those words, and you believe that, you're already playing according to his rules. And that is what he wants you to do. That is what he wants me to do. And I want to encourage us as believers today that we I have to be aware of the enemy's scheme. We have to be aware of the enemy's playbook. His playbook is based on only one fundamental rule that Christ told us from John 8, 48, 44, that he is a liar. There is no communication between the children of God and the enemy that will not transpire in lies. He will always tell you, lies listen the enemy even tried it against the lord jesus let's go quickly to luke chapter 4 so that you can see what i'm talking about it was an incident that happened after 40 days of christ fasting and coming out of the desert and look at what it says here then jesus being filled with the holy spirit returned from the jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil and on these days he ate nothing and afterwards, when he had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread, but by every word of God. But the key thing, he says, he says If you are. So you see, it was twisting Christ's identity round. And sometimes the enemy does that to us. If you're a believer, 
you should be healed by now. If you're a believer, you shouldn't have any problem. If you're a believer, you shouldn't have be any anxious. If you if you're a believer, God should have come through for you. The enemy tried to twist. Twisting of the truth is a lie. And he tried to twist what you know. Twist what you believe about the word of God into something else so that you can then succumb to his temptation, to his to his willing, to his bidding, so that you take a totally different role from what you know that God has called you to do. But praise God, there are solutions. Just before we finish, I'm just going to share some things with you which I want you to hold on to. The first thing I want you to do is this. In Romans 4.23, it says, Diligently keep your heart, for out of it flows the issue of life. Be mindful of what you allow into your heart. Don't allow fear into your heart. Don't allow anxiety into your heart. Don't allow doubt into your heart. Don't allow unforgiveness. Actually, unforgiveness was one of the things that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, uh, 2 10. He talks about unforgiveness. That is a tool that the enemy uses. Don't allow, so diligently keep your heart. Make sure that things that are on it are not things that will allow the enemy to have a foothold. Because that is what he's looking for. The Bible says he's looking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Who will he devour? The people that is found that their hearts are willing and ready with the things that he can use. So doubt, fear, anxiety, unforgiveness, bitterness, strife. This is some of the things that allow the enemy a foothold. So do not give an enemy the foothold. Do not allow him to ply you with lies. God is for you. He will always be for you. He says, I will be before you. I will go with you. I will not leave you. Remember what he said to you in Isaiah 41 verse 10. He says, he will uphold you with his righteous right hand. He said, he will not leave you or forsake you. No matter what you're going through. No matter how dark they might seem, do not let the enemy deceive you. Number two, be a student of the word. Know what the word said. And I love it. The Lord said to Joshua in Joshua 1, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you might do according to all that is in it, and you might prosper and have good success. Keep the word of God in your heart. Listen, the, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, 9, 9, he said, Your word I have hidden in my heart so that I will not sin against you. Keep the word of God in your heart. Daily renew, number three, daily renew your mind. Yeah? Romans chapter 12. Let's turn to that very, very quickly. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the masses of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, only acceptable to God, which is your reasonable self. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So daily renew your mind with the word of God. Fourthly, Calm yourself in the armor of God. Yeah, let's go quick. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about putting on the whole armor. It says, have you done all to stand? Have you done all to stand? It says, stand. Therefore, putting all the whole armor. Look at this. It says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. What is the wiles of the enemy? The trickery of the enemy. What is the trickery based on? Lies. Yeah. It says, for we do not wrestle against the whole, the flesh and the blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly place. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand it in the even day and even having done all to stand Stand therefore, and then he went on us telling us regarding our waist with the belt of truth, putting on the breast of righteousness, putting on the preparation of gospel of feet on our feet. He talks about taking on the shield of faith, which will be able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one, put on the element of salvation, and then the last one, hold on to the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
And last but least, which I want to tell you about, is focus on Christ. Make Christ your focus. When you make Christ your focus, when there's no room for anything else, the enemy cannot find a way in. Because every time that the enemy comes, he sees someone whose heart and mind are totally preoccupied with Christ, who the word of God is fully embedded in them. Every listen, every time that Christ, every time that Christ has to confront the enemy, he uses the word of God. Go back and look and look for every time that the enemy comes with another agenda to, to turn something around to, to come up with his trickery, the Christ come to him with the word. So I want to encourage you, just as I finished, I want to encourage you to be student of the word. I want to encourage you to put the whole word of God into your heart so that you can stand against the lies of the enemy. The enemy cannot win. The enemy will not win. The enemy shall not win because you are covered. You have the word of God inside you. And when the enemy come with his trickery, with his wiles, with his fairy that you stand with the word because you know what the word of God says. On that note, I want to say God bless you. Let me remind you that at the end of this message, please tune in to watch our children's junior church messages online as well. They are enriching, they are blessing, and I pray that the Lord will keep you and watch over you. Remember, in all things, Christ is Lord, and you are more than conqueror through him who loves you. God bless you. Till the next time.